Good evening and welcome to it. This is the Private Property Podcast, where we provide you with valuable knowledge and information on all things property related. Whether you are a first time home buyer, a seasoned investor, or you're just looking for some expert advice, we have got you covered. All you have to do is tune in every Tuesday and every Thursday at 7 p.m. for tips, insights, and expert advice on all burning topics that are related to property, because this podcast is proudly brought to you by Private Property. Remember, you can find your new home on privateproperty.co.za. On tonight's episode, we'll be getting the lowdown on some of the new tax provisions that you need to be aware of in the 2023-24 tax season. Joining me in studio, a regular and a fave. We're going to unpack this topic with Shiliboy Mutiba, who's the director of Tax Edu ZA and Intigen Private Wealth. But before we dive into the conversation, please remember to comment below and share your thoughts with us about today's show. You can join the conversation by using the hashtag, hashtag find your new home on privateproperty.co.za or hashtag the private property podcast on all social media. We'll be keeping an eye out for your posts and we may even feature some of your comments on the show. Like I said, I'm not alone in studio. Back is a local fave telling us about all things tax as usual. Shelly Boy, welcome back to studio. How are you? Thank you so much for having me. I'm all good. How are you? Um, You know, alive and kicking. That's good. I know tax is your favorite thing to talk about. <laughs> so I'm not going to bother trying to talk to you. I'm not going to ask you how the first quarter has been. I'm not going to ask you how business is going. I'm just going to ask you about tax. I'm sure commissioner is doing well about that. <laughs> Listen, what surprises does SARS have in store for taxpayers in the 2023-2024 tax season? It's actually more something that we've been uh, preparing because if you have listened to the budget speech, you could tell that the direction that uh, the National Treasury and SARS is actually moving towards. Mm. Um, Recently, I think on the 29th of March, they published a draft public notice and I, I'll suggest that most of you guys go read out it. there and read it. <laughs> so in within that, and I, they, they are, they, they are persons as defined from tax point of view that have been listed in there. There's about sixteen, if I'm not mistaken, there. But I want to zoom in into three mm. categories that I think they are relevant to the viewers out there. And the, the first one is uh, property pr- practitioners. You know out there, if you are property practitioners, what it, what are the requirements that mm. you need to be comply with? Formerly known as estate agents. Over and above and, and others, yes. right. Then then there's the added trust, right? Most property investors love trust, property trust, family mm. trust. Of course, wealth creators, it's important also to consider things like trust. That is number one. And then the third one that I want to zoom in is the guys that now are installing solars. Okay. Yes, these service providers that go out uh, and installing solars for domestic use purposes. You may find that you as the homeowner, you then installing that solar panel. What are the responsibility for that service provider? So now let's unpack that quickly. Okay. So you might be a, a property practitioner and you find that you're actually uh, managing rental property on behalf of a property investor. Mm. Then there's certain amounts that you sometimes pay back to the uh, say landlord. It could mm. be rental, it could be issues of interest on those deposits that you probably put uh, as a form of investment on behalf mm. of the landlord. Yes. So such information, you will be required now to report to SARS, right? About the interest. Those, that information, and, and those, those amounts, those yes, yes, those amounts that you'll be paying to the Miscellaneous. Lo- exactly, you'll be paying <laughs> to the landlords you need to be reporting back to SARS. So SARS is trying to do what? To reconcile. You now, as a property investor, you find Mm. that you are getting so much money from the property practitioner, but you're not actually disclosing some of this money. Yes, because you, it's not consolidated in one place. There's no if you're it getting, could be for many reasons. If you're getting this other fourth hour here, another five here, another seven there. Exactly. So I'll advise people to make sure that whatever they're getting from 
uh, from prop- property practitioners, mm. they actually disclose because SARS already have that kind of information way ahead. Now, that is one aspect. So the trust also, if you've got trust there and you're a trustee, mm. there could be the responsibilities where now you are required now to disclose to SARS any distribution that vested for the beneficiary. Let's say you're a beneficiary and we say because you've got a child, there is a trust fund baby mm. and then you're distributing certain... I so wish. You're distributing <laughs> certain money. Uh, you are vesting certain income on, on behalf of those children. The trustees now are, will be required to actually report to SARS. Mm. So that is one component of it. There could be other things where you, start, you find that trust disposes a property and then there's capital gain. The trustee decide that, you know what, let's distribute these capital gains to these beneficiaries. Mm. Such information must be disclosed. To, now it's the responsibility of who is the responsibility and obligation of the trustees. Because now, if you as a beneficiary now, when you're submitting your income tax returns, you actually don't even disclose. The SARS already knows that how much you got in the previous 12 months period. Mm. So now you might find yourself getting letters SARS to say, listen, here are the penalties because it not even never disclosed. And that could be a tax evasion, by the way, because of non-disclosure. Then you can find yourself in those um, uh, prisons. Yes. Now, that is the second part. <laughs> then the third part, as I mentioned... Sorry, I'm laughing at prison because we yeah. we now know one can escape. Um, oh, wow. But anyway, it's fine. <laughs> Hopefully not. Hopefully not. So now... Then the third one that I want to zoom in is these service providers. You, you remember um, during the, the Minister uh, of Finance budget mm. speech. There was the rebate when it now yes. came to the solar installation. But the money is only up to 15000 Yes, rent, correct. And it only goes to the one who is paying for the... So what is yes? What is happening is that if I'm a I'm, I'm a homeowner, mm. um, I hope that you're buying properties through private property, then you then do what you'll obviously be installing those solar panels, mm. right? You claim those that uh, rebate up to fifteen thousand. Now there will be a, this completion certificate that you probably get. So that person who is installing that that service provider that you hired to install those uh, solar panels will be now required to submit to SARS such kind of information. So what SARS is trying to do is trying to make it an obligation to say, if as a Chile boy now, having installed the solar panels, mm. and then I come and tell SARS that, no, I, I installed this solar, how will SARS corroborate that information? So they'll be having this information from the service providers. Yes. Yes. And then you can know now, since it's an obligation, it kind of puts some sort of fiduciary duties on these service providers. Then, mm. then they, they're trying also to make sure that people don't cheat the system. So you, then obviously then making sure that you don't cheat. I mean, as a company, as a service provider, you wouldn't want to find yourself cheating the system because it's not worth it, mm. right? So obviously then that is added responsibility that those who are in this business of installing solars must be on a lookout. I'm a very big believer in the University of YouTube. So what if now I'm just installing solar for myself and maybe my mom and my sister and whatever, mm. Because I've learned how from a YouTube tutorial. Where am I going to be getting the certificate to be proving? But remember, for you to qualify for that rebate, you will need that completion certificate. So it's sort of a COC. Uh, so you will not even be eligible. So it's fine. Some that- will be happy that you're actually <laughs> helping to reduce the burden of energy. But then you're actually not going to get that rebate because okay. you don't have those supporting documents that are necessary for you to claim the rebate. So I'm not helping myself, actually. You're actually not helping yourself. I must you might actually burn the house. <laughs> Luckily, I don't earn enough to be able to own a home right now and it'll be someone else's problem. Um, Transfer duty costs for 2023. Hmm. Let's talk about that. What's it going to cost me in 2023? Who's responsible for those transfer duties now? Going back to the budget speech, you, you probably have seen, uh, I mean, I, feel, I think we spoke about this also that uh, as part of the uh, the Minister of Finance budget speech, you saw certain tables being adjusted for yes. inflation. So transfer duty was one of them where they actually adjusted that to about 1.1 $1. 1, uh, million. Mm. So if you're buying a property that is about 1.1 $1. 1 million, then, then you'll pay transfer mm. duty. But what I just want to, and we should not try to educate our, our viewers is around the difference between transfer cost and the transfer duty. Got you. So the transfer cost can include transfer duty. 
because then it could include the legal fees, could include the, the transfer due to being a tax to SARS again for the tra- movement of the of the property, immovable property, residential property. Mm. So it could, in, and then the transfer cost could include the deeds fees, could include the red clearance uh, fees, could, you know, all those postage fees and all those type of mm. things. Of course, the bigger component also there being the conveyancer's fees mm. for them to help you, to assist you to move the property from the seller to, to you the as buyer. the purchaser. Mm. As you mentioned, as you asked the question, who's responsible for this? The person who is responsible for this to pay this, unfortunately, is the buyer. The buyer has to pay this is the tax for you to buy. It's like you buying something at, at the shop where you are paying you are paying VAT. So in this case, you are buying immovable property which is residential. Then you have to pay that tax. Now that is that is wise response. So one of the things I always say that I, I'll tell the viewers to always you know kind of push if they can is around issues of appointment of their conveyances. Okay. If you are regular and retaining a property investor, I always advise. Try to strong arm the seller to ensure that you actually appoint your own conveyancer. Why am I saying that? Because it can help you, you know, when you are a retainer, exactly, when you are a retaining client, you can negotiate discount on those transfer costs, Mm. particularly the convincing fees. But obviously, I don't want the conveyancers to dislike me for saying that. Yeah. Yeah. mm. You can ask a cousin or something. (laughs) Yes. But we know for a fact, obviously, that the adjustment to that table has been made. Yes. So in terms of now the transfer duties, we're looking at a bit of a relaxation for some people who are not within a certain income bracket. Uh, the, the transfer, where, where we're saying, we're saying, if you're buying a property that is uh, above 1.1 yes. million, yes, then... But before it was, I think, 1, 1 million. million. was yes, 1 million. exactly. So, so it kind of give a bit of... Just um, a bit of a leeway, exactly, a bit of a break, just exactly, a bit of space. Exactly. 100,000 is a lot of money. It re- it's a lot of money. I know, because I don't have it exactly. right now. And I will. <laughs> Silly boy. Can I have 100,000 now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I give you an answer. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I gave you. You answer. heard it here first. Shelly Boy Matiba has offered to give me a hundred thousand rand. Don't worry. I ask all my guests for money. Um, under which circumstances would one be exempt from transfer duties? There are. Um, I mean, we're obviously, going to zoom in based on our viewers. There are various ways where you find that transfer duties not applicable. The common one is when people divorce. Uh, when people divorce, and you find that you go dissolve the the, the marriage. Through the court, you find that we're splitting assets. Mm. That in the in those contexts, then the transfer duty is not gonna be applicable, right? That is the the common one. The the second one is when people passes on. When a person passes on, we obviously have to transfer properties from your name to the beneficiaries, right? Because you no longer are alive. Yeah, yeah. of course, You're a dead person a dead person can't be owning things yes. ideally, right? <laughs> so so but now in some countries they can vote. <laughs> <laughs> Even end salaries. So, <laughs> so now, so in those contests, though, then we we need to transfer those properties from yourself as a diseased person to the beneficiary. So, in those contexts, then um, it's it's the transfer duty is not applicable, okay. right? Of course, there some transactions don't go through. You know, they don't they don't obviously they they call it a cancelled tra- transactions. Mm. So, in those contexts, also then. Uh, transfer duty is not applicable. Provided is no one liable for that when it doesn't go through, or someone reneges, perhaps on no, no one. Remember, you've got a th- six months to pay transfer duty oh, from I the see. date of signature. Yes, so we obviously within that six months before even the conveyance has lodged it with the deeds office. If the deal doesn't go through, so it's not gonna. It's fine. Yeah, exactly. So that is that. Then the the fourth one that I think is more so relevant. It's normally when people move properties uh, between themselves. And, and the companies, but using certain rollover provisions. I'm not going to be technical about that. Uh, you know, as we call them things like asset for share transaction and things mm. like that. So you can bypass a transfer duty in that you are allowed for that. So those are some of the things that I think, or obvious, or another one is for whoever might be getting married out there, it's let's Me, say I just it, got married. oh wow congratulations thank you so it, it could be someone who um let's say you're getting married in community of property but then your spouse had properties before then you know by virtue of you getting married in community of property then it means you are getting ownership a certain undivided share of mm. the assets that they own within that then you are not eligible you obviously you're not going to be obligated to pay the transfer duty in that yeah because yes. i've already given you my surname <laughs> 
<laughs> I don't know if it's worth <laughs> the prospect. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. <laughs> but I'm, yeah, I'm I get you. I'm a community property with a cruel sweetie. I'm not trying to play these games with my spouse. Okay. Love you, babe. Um, listen, has there anything that's been changed about tax on rental income? Now, when it comes to how it affects the property investor, I think I think what I just want to emphasize not necessarily something that I picked it up that has changed, but what I want to emphasize is around the whole trading in property. Mm. So, because we we need to be clear, you are earning rental and you are earning you, you obviously incurring certain expenses to produce or to in production of that particular rental income. Mm-hmm. So, if you make losses. And and SARS picked it up that you are actually not running bona fide uh, business or trade. Actually, let me use correct terminology: being trade. Mm. And we can define trade in other. How platform. would you run at a loss in that kind of situation? Are you talking like I'm? I've got a rental. I'm charging someone three thousand rand a month, and then the geezer bursts, and then I have to like fix everything in the house because the floors are all broken and whatever. Is, what is running at a loss? Running at a loss is when rental income, exactly the when ren- rental income is actually less than the expenses. Okay. Yes, for generating that rental okay, income. Okay, cool. Yes. So there are people who do that and you find that you're actually not in trade. So SARS will then do what? Reinfence that loss mm. to say you cannot deduct this loss against other income. Remember when you submit uh, rental, um, when you submit your income tax returns, mm. you add rental income as part of what you call gross income. Yes. And then you add other gross, uh, other type Whatever of other incomes. Whatever other money is yes, that are coming that in. Yes. yes, it could be salary, it could be other things, right? It could be other investment incomes that you're bringing in. So SARS will say, this net expense or net loss as a result of you renting the property mm. cannot be set off against other income if you're not running a bona fide trade. Got you. And, but if you are running a proper bona fide trade, then you could be allowed to be to deduct that net loss against other income. The gross income. The other income, yes. Yes. Yeah, correct. Load shedding mm. and the power crisis mm. it remains a crisis. Mm. Mm. Correct. Which has a direct impact on property. Correct. What is going to happen in your view? Look, I mean, we all know that with uh, with load shedding, it affects the bottom line. Yes. Right? Because as a property investor, for you to be competitive, it means you need to satisfy your tenants. And I mean, I'm in a, also in a student accommodation in my smaller uh, one or two units. Um, they start to ask, do you have backup mm. for load shedding? And for them to say, do you have backup? It means they say, do I have inverters? Do I have solars? You know, do I have uh, US, all these LED yeah. lightings? Mm. Those are costly. And I mean, um, I, I remember I was in one of the events, l- property events last week, and I had to wait before I can go home because I was worried getting home when it's dark, it's low chilling. What does it mean? It means that the, you need high security mm. system because then the high, then it becomes more costly because if it's dark, people might feel like, you know what, the crime rate can shoot up. The risk of everything is significantly increased by being in complete darkness. Correct. You are at risk of like being crimed in every street corner, everywhere you go. You are at risk of like jeopardizing your job and your work because you haven't had electricity throughout the whole day. Mm. Your students can't do their assignments, Correct. which means that they will flunk out of university and be excluded. Now their parents are out of the money that yes. they paid. It, the knock-on effect is endless. People who were on the fence and you know, kind of struggling, they're more likely going to default as more and more uh, cost of living is actually increasing. So you you need to start thinking about that. So it, and and I always say that uh, the administrative side of things is becoming more demanding mm. when you're running a business because making money is no longer that simple. It's straightforward. There's an added more work that you need to do for you to even get good tenants. You know, maybe you might need to consider insurance on things like that. That's extra cost. Mm. You know, so there's quite a lot of things that are going to f- affect a lot of property investors. Can we write to SARS and ask for some kind of rebate for all of the food that we lose, like in our fridges? <laughs> I mean, dead serious. In our fridges and in mm. our deep freezers, mm. during load shedding. Then we take pictures. 
And then mm-hmm. we send, we compile, we compile, we compile. Then Pagu text return. When we do e filing, city Mamela Sars. I also lost. And then we put all our receipts there from Woolies and Pick and Pay and all these other stores and Boxer. And we say, you owe me this amount of money, pay me back. It doesn't hurt to try, right? Does it? So you might. And I'm going to start a petition. Do you know that? I'm going to start a petition that we must ask SARS to pay us back. We must have a, a food rebate for the money that we. Unless you're in a, in a, in a. I mean, you can write that off as a write off of stock. If you are in a business of it's trade, like, I'm or in a business you're... of trade of my life, <laughs> I'm trading and fighting for my life. <laughs> I'm in a stock fell. I pay money every mm. month for my stock fell mm. to get half a sheep in December and whatever, whatever. Mm. Then there's no electricity. Which I am is now. Mm. So, like I said, it doesn't hurt to try, but you know, yeah. So try it, <laughs> and you have to represent me. <laughs> You you deal with the legal. You deal with the technical. I'll I'll recommend the attorneys that will represent <laughs> you. <laughs> it sounds like you don't believe in my idea, but it's gonna benefit you at the end of the day, silly boy. Before I let you go, what advice would you give to now first time home buyer? Mm. I know I ask this all of the time. Yeah, but there are a lot of people still going into the property market. They're optimistic. They've saved up. They've done their research. They are really wanting to go now into investing in their first property and entering the property market now today. Come what me. Look, I, I think for me, it's consider structures. Um, like I always tell people, what is the best way to buy whatever the property? You need to understand those things mm. because you need to think about things like, should I pass on what's going to happen to this property that I'm buying, Right. And and what I'm emphasizing is people tend to think about these things uh, later. Mm. Uh, uh, and you need to think about them now. When, as long as you're creating wealth, you need to think about what would happen to this money when I pass on. Mm. You need to think about that. And also you need to think of how you buy in this property. I mean, I was, when I was coming here, I was actually speaking to one of my clients, asking me about that. I'm, I'm, I'm going to flip Shilipo sh- sh- this problem. I'm like, okay, but you're flipping do you, what do you want to do with this money? Do you want to do you want to eat this money right away, or do you want to reinvest it? It doesn't make sense for you when you are already on a high marginal tax rate to consider flipping in your name. It doesn't make sense, mm. does it? So think of maybe simple company, but what is continuity around that? Maybe consider a trust that is owned by by this. Uh, um, I mean, the company that is owned by a trust for mm. continuity purposes, because also you don't want a situation when you pass on. Um, and then you obviously then you have to pay estate duties and things like that, or you have to pay legal fees for that matter. So think about those things. Speak to people, engage people, listen to the podcast, private property podcast. There's a lot of content that you can engage on mm. and, and ensure that you're actually um uh, you know you're structuring yourself uh well. I've got patience, you know, advice because I think it, it, it really applies to everything in life. You must just sometimes wait it out because you don't know what could be around the corner that will shake things up for you if you put all of your eggs in one basket and expect them to hatch. Exactly. There could be a coronavirus around the corner. There could be some AI or printing technology that's going to be printing houses within 24 hours available. Like there's there's so much that could happen. So I think having patience and just taking your time um, to sort of perfect your craft in in any area, but most especially property now. Exactly, and and a build up really great advice. Exactly, and a build a position of power. It could be more building cash reserves. Mm. I mean, that helps you to so that should something goes wrong, you can be able to tap into your cash reserve position. Shelly boy, I think that's where I'm going to leave it today. Thank you so much for joining me in the studio, the Private Property Podcast. We are always very happy to hear from you. Um, and I've, I've learned a lot. Um, when will you come back? I'll come back. When is, when is tax season? July? Yes, tax season is in July, uh, so maybe we should do that, yeah. I think, uh, but I have, a, no, I have a lot of questions for you before that, so I think you must come back before that. If you have any questions for Shilly Boy, actually, before July, when you have to start filing your personal income taxes 
Um, please leave them on our social media pages so that we know to ask him those questions Correct. when he's back mm. before July. Yeah. Otherwise, thank you so much for joining me as always. Listen, this is tonight's episode of the Private Property Podcast. Please remember to comment um, on the comment sections below. Use the hashtag, hashtag Private Property Podcast. Otherwise, I will see you on the next episode every Tuesday, every Thursday at 7 p.m. is when you can catch this podcast. Otherwise, I'm Sibs Malaba Matiela. Yes, the Malaba is new because I just got married. Um, but that has nothing to do with this podcast, so I should go. Goodbye, good night, good luck. Love you loads. Kisses.